of Gaya in Bihar. Tavish Khair teaches at, at Aarhus University in Denmark and is the author of various books, including the poetry collections Where Parallel Lines Meet, published by Penguin, and Man of Glass, HarperCollins 2010, and the studies uh, Babu Fictions, Alienation in Indian English Novels, Oxford University Press 2001, The Gothic, Postcolonialism and Otherness, published by Palgrave in 2010, the New Xenophobia, again, Oxford University Press, 2016, and the novels, The Bus Stopped, Picador, 2004, Filming, again, Picador, 2007, and The Thing About Thugs, HarperCollins, 2010, and Night of Happiness, Picador, 2018. His honors and prizes include the All India Poetry Prize, awarded by the Poetry Society and the British Council. He has been a writer in residence at the York University in the UK, and a visiting fellow at Cambridge University and Leeds University, also in the United Kingdom. He has also been a visiting fellow at Delhi University, Jawaharlal Univers Nehru University, Jamia Millia Islamia, uh, and the Indian Institute of Technology in Bhubaneswar. His novels have been shortlisted for several prestigious prizes, including the Man Asian Literary Prize, the DSC Prize and the Encore Award, and he has been translated into several languages. So he is an academic and an author all in one. So may I now invite Professor Tabish Khair for his lecture, please. Thank you, Atul. If I may refer to you by your first name, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. My thanks to everyone associated uh, with the series, uh, Pramod, of course, uh, but uh, uh, all, 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 all the professors and uh, uh, lecturers associated with it. In particular, my thanks to Minakshi, who has been coordinating with me. Um, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I will need to indulge in a bit of throat clearing. And the reason for that is that I made a PowerPoint, but I can see that uh, I cannot share that PowerPoint using my access. So maybe I can ask one of the organizers to share the PowerPoint with you. Uh, and while that is being arranged, I'll move on and uh, uh, give you a kind of introduction to what I want to do today. Uh, as far as I'm aware, I have almost uh, one hour. And usually I feel that talking for more than 45 minutes is extremely tiring for the audience. So I'll try to keep it to about 45 minutes, keep my lecture to about 45 minutes or so, and then we can have some discussion. Thank you. Thank you for this. <laughs> uh, I think I can I move this on my own, but I don't think that would be possible so I'll have to ask you to move it uh, because I don't think I can do anything to the PowerPoint from here so Atul or Minakshi whoever is running the show yes. there we'll, okay. we'll, once you indicate to us we will move the lights yes we have okay. that, thank you thank you so when I I'm going to say the next slide please just move it on okay. yes sure. thank, sure. you. thank you um, what I want to talk about is obviously Indian novels written originally in English. Uh, the title might be slightly misleading in the sense that, of course, there can be Indian novels translated into English. I wish I could talk about all of them. Uh, the older I get, the more interested I get in novels translated into English, not just from Indian languages, but from a lot of other languages. Uh, and the, the reasons for it, I, I, I might not give you those reasons here because I think they're not purely uh, academic. They probably have a lot to do with where I come from and where I am and so on and so forth. Uh, and, and, and certain problems that I have, not as much as an academic, but more as a writer, as a 
so-called creative writer with uh, the anglophone writing scene which i feel has uh, or, or the visible sections of which i feel have a very well-defined class location which however is largely ignored by people especially in western academia because they obviously cannot read those locations as locations as well as people like you or I might be able to. But I leave that out. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is Indian novels in English. And before I talk about Indian novels in English, I'll have to just remind you, though, since you're in India, you probably do not need a reminder. I'll need to remind you of the prehistory of the novel. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Yeah. Uh, and by that, I mean that uh, even though, as you know, Indians have started writing substantially in English only in the late 18th century, when you have travel books in particular and poetry, and the Indian, English novel, uh, Indi Indian novels in English can be dated to the 19th century by and large. But despite that, there one can talk of a prehistory, because when Indians, as Raja Rao, came to say, and we'll look at that forward later on, when Indians write in English, he didn't say that, but there's kind of an assumption of that. They do not only write in English, they also write in other Indian languages, English being just one of many languages spoken in India and used to write uh, sometimes creatively. Now, in my in my study from more than 20 years ago, Babu Fictions, which was referred to, what I actually tried to do was look at how this choice of English affects Indian writing in English. I was very young, I was doing my PhD, and sometimes I might have put it in words that I would not necessarily use today. But looking back at that study and recalling my endeavor, what I would say is that that was what I was attempting to do, trying to look at English as a language of creativity in India, a place where only some people speak English, and almost no one speaks English all the time, uh, particularly in novels, because novels presuppose the presence of voices in India, at least, they presuppose the presence of voices of people who would not speak English or who would not speak English in that particular context. Now, my argument in Babu Fictions was that different writers, different significant writers have tried to devise different means to cope with this. And then I, I tried to look at to what extent I felt some of the means worked and what were their strengths and, of course, what were the weaknesses. In that sense, the prehistory of the Indian novel and the Indian novel in English becomes important, uh, not just in terms of classical literature, like Sanskrit and Persian and so on and so forth, but also from the 18th century onwards in terms of vernacular literatures. Now, if we move on to the next slide, the other element that I would call for the sake of convenience, the history of Indian novels in English, is the British colonial presence. And again, I won't remind you of too many things there because you will all be aware of it. The only thing I would like to say, because this is something that I have become more cognizant of in recent years than I was when I was young and doing my research in the field, is that element in the middle, 1835, Macaulay, later Lord Macaulay's minutes on Indian education. Now, all of you will be familiar with it, especially the phrase where he says that a single shelf uh, of European literature is, is worth all the libraries of in, in, in Sanskrit and Arabic and so on and so forth. And we're all aware of the colonial underpinnings of that position. What, however, 
in our opposition to Macaulay, in our justified opposition of Mac to Macaulay, we tend to forget is that Macaulay was part of a larger movement that involved some other British administrators that also led to the propagation of vernacular Indian languages in many parts of India. This is something we tend to forget. And the reason for that was actually quite complex. In at least one case, the reason was that this particular British official wanted Indian riots, peasants, by and large, to be able to read some of the contracts that money lenders and talukdas and zamindas got them to sign. So what I'm trying to say is that English, right from the beginning, has had a strange relationship to other languages in India. It's not necessarily just a simplistic relationship of erasure, as very often we suspect. There's also an element where English has, to some extent, enabled certain kinds of discourses. And the older I get, the more I feel that this needs to be pointed out uh, more often than it has been and more often than I have done in my early research and early writing. So that, of course, is the history of the British colonial presence. And that, as I'm trying to indicate, is much more complex than a simple uh, dismissal of English as a foreign language, which is what very often happens, uh, keeping in mind in particular that English as a language of creativity has a history in India that is almost as old as that of some other vernacular languages, which would never be considered foreign. Now, that point needs to be stressed. But the other point also needs to be stressed, something that Ajaz Ahmad in particular had pointed out in In Theory and other, other critics early on, which is that English has a particular relationship to other Indian languages. Uh, and even that relationship is much more complex than we assume. For instance, I would argue, and this is something that those of you who have the languages might want to take up, I would argue that English has had a different set of relationships to classical languages of learning in India. And even there, there are differences between how English has related to, say, Sanskrit in India and Farsi in India. But there's a different set of relationships there. And English has related differently, again, to certain vernacular languages. Uh, that, again, is an element that's very complex and needs to be looked at more carefully than sometimes we happen, we, we, we tend to do. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Now, along with this history, of course, is the history of Indians who were in, who were, who were, uh, let's say, influenced by English. Now, usually we have uh, the official version. We have people like, uh, say, Raja Ram Mohan Roy, who very often is is put in 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 a group of uh, westernized reformers which of course is a complete misreading of actually what he was doing you will remember that he started publishing uh, a newspaper in farsi in persian that he started he he wrote in 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 languages other than english before he switched over to english uh, and he started using english as well so the very idea of a westernized reformer is a kind of uh, anglophone colonial appropriation of people like raja ram Mohan roy uh, so, but you have you have that trajectory of of people like that people from a certain class uh, people like dean muhammad who wrote the what is the first extent uh, text in english by an indian a travel book uh, and these are people who came from a certain class who already had two or three languages behind themselves and then picked up English. That history is more or less on record, even though perhaps more work needs to be done on it. The other history which is not on record and which perhaps can never be recovered is that of Indians who were exposed to English 
through their jobs. This happened all through the 19th century. I have just posted two examples, Luskers and Ayers. Uh, obviously, some of these people picked up some English and picked up English in a certain way. Uh, we have almost no means to recover the Englishes, but the English has not disappeared. In some ways, that tradition of working, what, what I would, for the sake of, for, the, for, for lack of a better term, would call working class English. I know this is a problematic description because one can justly object that the working classes in India do not speak English. So, but, uh, but for the sake of convenience, I'll use working class English. I'm referring to people from the working classes who have had to do with highly Anglophone families, especially in the colonial period. Uh, the British. Uh, now, this has not entirely disappeared. It, it has seeped into Indian English writing too in different ways. Uh, most obviously, in Salman Rushdie's exploration of what some people came to call Hinglish early on, a certain kind of uh, English that sounds Indian. Uh, I'll come back, I'll, or I'll return to these matters later on. Can I have the next slide, please? Now, if we move on to the first extent accounts of the West, uh, uh, the reason why I have these two accounts here is uh, there are two reasons. First of all, I want you to be aware that not all of it existed in English. There were accounts in other languages too, uh, Urdu, Farsi, a bit later Marathi, Bangla, and so on and so forth. Um, yeah, and uh, and and here you have uh, two accounts. Uh, first one called the Wonders of Vilayat, written originally in Persian or Farsi, and the other one, again, uh, the Travels of Mirza Abu Talib Khan, written again in Farsi, uh, both roughly from the late 18th century. Now, if I can have the less uh, the, the 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 next slide, please. Now here, we move on to an English account, an English travel account, which you, some of you would be familiar with. The Travels of Dean Muhammad. Yep, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, now it is interesting to actually stop and look at this, um, uh, this excerpt from the Travels of Dean Muhammad. Uh, this is what he says, trying to explain why he had to write all these pages about his travels, some of them, some of which took place in India, and the rest of them took place after he had moved to England. I felt some timid inclination, even in the consciousness of incapacity, to describe the manners of my countrymen, who I am proud to think have still more of the innocence of our ancestors than some of the boasting philosophers of Europe. So that's his explanation, his reason for writing that book. Now let's look at the next excerpt. This is from a book written around the same time in Farsi and then translated into English, uh, written in Farsi by Mirza Abu Talib Khan. Uh, and this is what he says, writing in Farsi. The wanderer over the face of the earth, Abu Talib, the son of Muhammad of Ispahan, begs leave to inform the curious that he was compelled to undertake many tedious journeys during which he beheld various wonders, both by sea and by land. It therefore occurred to him that if he were to write all the circumstances of his journey through Europe, to describe the curiosities and wonders that he saw, and to give some account of the manners and customs of the various nations he visited, all of which are little known to Asiatics, it would afford a gratifying banquet to his countrymen. Now, I very often refer to these two extracts uh, because I find them so uh, illuminating. Uh, illuminating, illuminating in, 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 in a totally unconscious manner, because Dean Muhammad writing in English has a totally different 
set of reasons uh, compared to Mirza Abu Talib writing in Farsi, which in the late 18th, 19th century was one of India's languages. Uh, bear in mind that Asadullah Khan Ghalib, the great uh, Urdu poet uh, from the first half of the 19th century, also wrote magnificently in Farsi. Uh, there's a very interesting translation of his account of Banaras that just finally come out in English. Uh, I forget the title, but I'm very sure you'll be able to to look it up. Banaras, of course, was a city that he absolutely loved. Uh, but again, that was written in Farsi, which is why it's taken so long for it to come out in English. Now, you'll notice that uh, Abu Talib Khan writes in a way, uh, explains his reasons in a way that is faintly reminiscent of how some European travel writers from the same period explained their reasons for writing their books. Oh, I went out there and it was such a different place, exotic land, different nations. And I thought it would be fun to actually talk about all these, uh, all these different people and exotic rituals and nations when I go, went back to my country. Okay, that, that's essentially what <laughs> Abu Talib is saying. Okay, uh, on the other hand, Dean Muhammad has a much more defensive and even though that word has to be used very carefully because he was not an anti-colonial person, he has a putatively anti-colonial position where he says, oh, the philosophers of Europe think that they're really smart. They boast a lot. They think that we are really, we are really primitive. There's nothing to learn from us. But I want to show that actually there's a lot to learn from us too, from our history, from our ancestors. And that is why I am writing this book. Now, one can even claim that the fact that Dean Muhammad was writing in English made him predisposed to take a certain stand, a stand that can be called defensive, a stand that faces the outside world, the world that Dean Muhammad is accessing in English. On the other hand, Talib Khan writing in Farsi does not seem to have the same need to take that kind of a defensive position because he doesn't seem to be speaking to that world outside his own complex of languages. I'll come back to this matter a bit later. Can I have the next slide? Now, obviously, the history of Indian novels in English needs to include those British writers who lived in India for a number of years and wrote in English. The most obvious one there would be Rudyard Kipling, which is why I featured him uh, and I have given you a text by him to read. Now, usually when we, when we think of Rudyard Kipling, we think of, uh, in particular, uh, those famous or infamous lines, oh, East is East and West is West and never the twain shall meet. Till, I and, uh, till earth and the sky stand presently at God's great judgment. See, this is towards the end of that poem. The poem starts with, O oh, east is east and west is west and never shall the twain meet. Then it goes on and describes, it's, it's a kind of ballad anyway, it describes um, some actions. And then it ends with these, these lines. Uh, and look at the last two lines. But there is neither east nor west border nor breed nor birth when two strong men stand face to face though they come from the ends of the earth okay now this is i think quite typical of uh, writing from this inheritance rudyard kipling was especially in his journalism not just a champion of colonization but also like everyone in the 19th century, essentially a racist. Uh, on the other hand, there's a much more complex relationship to India than we tend to assume when we focus only on certain texts, even certain parts of texts, without looking at the rest of it. Now, here you have a kind of discourse of masculine adventurism. Now, this is problematic from a feminist perspective, but 
it does not distinguish between the European and the Indian. At that level, when two strong men meet, everything is fine. They can meet. Okay. Now, you can see elements of that in the story I've given you to read too. It's a, it's a story that can be criticized from so many different perspectives. But the one thing that it does, which actually makes it stand out from certain uh, evangelical and civilizational positions, especially back in Britain, is the fact, the two things it does. Number one, it attributes real power to Indian divinities. You do something and something weird happens to you, something that cannot be rationally explained. Okay. You disrespect them and a certain kind of curse turns you into something like a werewolf. Okay. It's not just something that's happening in someone's head, it's happening on the body of the offender. Now, this is interesting because it is not entirely in keeping with rationalist Indian positions on uh, rationalist European positions on Indian belief, Indian religions, all of them, all of which were reduced to superstitions, and so on and so forth. And it's also not in keeping with the evangel evangelical position of uh, to to some extent, though there it's a much more complex position. Uh, now the other thing that Kipling does is that he occludes the real basis of colonial power, but he never forgets it. They make this mewling uh, leper take back his curse, using something that the narrator says is not fit to be described. This thing involves heating, iron rods, and so on and so forth. So what is the thing that is not fit to be described? It's violence. It's torture. Kipling's narrator knows that colonial power rests on physical power. It's not just a magnanimous gesture. It's not just a civilizational gesture. It's a question of being able to do certain things to colonial subjects. Okay. Now, now, these are things that, are again, interesting about what one can call Anglo-Indian writing from India. It, there's again a tension there, a complexity that can be raised if we look too quickly at just one aspect or at just one of the many aspects. Uh, the next slide, please. Similarly, when Indians have started writing in English, writing extensively in English. You come across a complexity that tends to be erased if we look at the matter too simplistically as just a colonial inheritance or as just some privileged Indians writing in a foreign language. Now, one example would be this sonnet by De Rosio, widely acknowledged as the first significant Indian poet in English. And I have just got some lines from it. I'll just read, read out these lines. So if, if you have the time, look up the sonnet. You've probably read it because most departments, at least when I was studying English literature in India, this was prescribed. Why hangst thou lonely on yon withered bow? Unstrung forever must thou there remain? Thy music was sweet, who hears it now? Why doth the breeze sigh over thee in vain? And then the concluding lines. Those hands are cold, but if thy notes divine, may be by mortal wakened once again, harp of my country, let me strike this train. What Derodi is saying in this sonnet, he refers to, in the last line, it becomes very clear, harp of my country. He refers to what in the Western tradition can be called the muses and so on and so forth. But he's giving, giving, giving them a, an Indian location. And he, he, uh, he says that this harp, which signifies culture, music, literature of his country, has been, has been lying 
has been hanging unused on a withered branch and so on and so forth. That's what the first three st stanzas of the no, it's, 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 it's not a Shakespearean sonnet, but anyway, it's uh, the first few lines of, 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 of the sonnet um, say. So, on the one hand, you can focus on how the sonnet largely, as some early, or some mid 20th century critics claim, mimics romantic poetry. Uh, though, of course, the word mimic is. Uh, a poisoned word, word, because when De Rossi was writing, the later romantics were still alive. People like Baron and so on and so forth were still alive in the late 18th century, or had just died recently. Okay, uh, so 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 the idea of mimicry doesn't really work. You can say that De Rossi is writing as part of a larger English tradition of poesy, of poetry, but. He locates it specifically in India, and his sonnet can see, be seen as not just a lemon for an orientalist lemon for the decay of India, but also a potential critique of the decay of India under the rule of East India Company. I'm not saying that is intentional, but it can be read along those lines. Okay. More so, if you if you if you want to actually stress that part, then you could ask yourself, why does he use harp of my country? Why doesn't he use lyre of my country? Now he's using a largely Greek set of images there. Lyre would fit better, but he uses harp. Now why? There's no reason in terms of uh, scanning. Harp and lyre are both accented. Uh, feet. Uh, so he could have said lie of my country. It might even have uh, worked with the let, let me strike this train. Lie of my country, let me strike this train. But he says half of my country. Now, if you want to push, push that envelope, you could say that this is because around the same time, one of the earliest massive agitations for Irish independence, Irish freedom had taken place. And in Calcutta, people were aware of it. They were aware of in Calcutta. Okay. And the harp was the sign of Irish independence. Could it be that Derodio, in choosing harp, is making a statement that is far more critical than it appears to be? So what I'm trying to say is that the idea that we can dismiss writing in English as, as simplistic along one line is problematic. It doesn't work. It doesn't work even when you look at early Indian English, Indian writing in English, or when you look at colonial writing in English by people like Kipling and so on and so forth. Now, if I may have the, the other the next slide. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to, to discuss this, but I, I was going to make a similar point with, with, with this uh, poem. Uh, and the point would, would have come back to stressing the fact that, among other things, among, uh, along with the imagery, which is a certain kind of imagery uh, that draws upon uh, Indian uh, songs and Indian notions of village life, uh, along with all that, you have the last line, Ram, Ram, I shall die. Uh, and uh, it's not, uh, Lord, oh Lord, I shall die. Now, if, if, if Serena Nadu was just writing for an Anglophone audience, she could have used Lord, oh Lord, with much better effect. Partly also because Ram, as an equivalent of Lord, was less commonly known among English readers outside India in the late 19th, early 20th centuries. And because in terms of scanning, Ram Ram is something that only an Indian would be able to pronounce. Uh, 
who is it? Is it Ram Ram? An anglophone speaker would have no idea. Uh, so Rajin Naidu is assuming that there would be a pair of Indian ears listening to the sound, and that only then does the music of her stanza, and she was a very musical writer, music of her stanza work. So again, what you're coming across is a much more complex relationship. Now, this is it, this complexity I wanted to highlight uh, before I move on to dealing more uh, particularly with Indian, write, Indian novels in English. Can I have the next slide, please? And obviously, the best place to start is Raja Rao's famous foreword to Kantapura. Uh, the telling has not been easy. One has to convey the various shades and omissions of a certain thought movement that looks maltreated in an alien language. I use the word alien, yet English is not really an alien language to us. It is the language of our intellectual makeup, like Sanskrit or Persian was before, but not of our emotional makeup. We are all instinctively bi bilingual, many of us writing in our own language and English. We cannot write like the English. We should not. We cannot write only as Indians. Bear in mind that Raja Rao is writing in the first half of the 20th century, and some of the words he used might seem odd to you. Uh, you might even argue that English is no longer just the language of our intellectual makeup, that it might also be the language of our emotional makeup for at least some Indians now or at least it might play some part in our emotional makeup along with other languages, which is mostly the case among, among urban, urban readers of English. But again, what Rao is pointing out is the fact that uh, Indian English writers tend to be bilingual, trilingual, multilingual, and this, again, as has been noted by historians, is not just a colonial gift, which is what used to irritate me in the days when I had moved to Denmark and started being part of post-colonial uh, debates. And very often the assumption was that colonial lands are multilingual, multicultural, and, and some of it was or a large part of it was the colonial uh, aspect, in the sense that you have the British and you have other Indian things, and then they get mixed. But the point is that uh, most of our medieval writers, for instance, composed in more than one language. Uh, people like Raleigh, more classical writers, and not when, when we think of medieval writers, we also think of writers who might not have written anything down, but they're songs and poems have percolated in different languages, sometimes composed by them because they themselves percolated across Indian languages they, uh, and, 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 and sang and composed in other Indian languages. So, so, so that's one tradition. But the other tradition too of, of more, let's say, more, more chirographic writers like say Ghalib uh, is also there. Ghalib wrote, as I pointed out, both in Urdu and in Farsi. Uh, so, so, so that aspect of bilingualism, of multilingualism, it was an Indian heritage. Uh, and Indian English, Indian writing in English also participates in it in its own ways, uh, because of its own particular relationship to other Indian languages. And, I, I, and, and I'll, 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 I'll come, I'll move on to that relationship in due course. Can I have the next slide, please? Now, when we talk of Indian novels in English, again, uh, we tend to make certain similar mistakes, mistakes that sort of attribute English to an alien space, when it's no longer, it has not been alien for us for a long time. One side, that's the nationalist mistake, where, oh, if you write in English, you're writing in a foreign language, and it all needs to be dismissed. On the other hand, there's a kind of, I would say, multicultural, global, multicultural mistake, which 
occupy another position. And there you have people who will get very offended at me for pointing out the fact that English does have a particular relationship. Not just to India, but to other Indian languages. The way in which Bangla relates to Hindi or Urdu relates to Bangla or Urdu relates to Hindi is very different from the way in which English relates to Bangla and Hindi and Urdu. This has a lot to do with the way in which English arrived in India, the way in which it has grown, it's largely or, or larger class location, uh, and the ways in which other Indian languages grew very often from older languages with a lot of interpenetration that had already happened between languages behind them. For instance, even if you come up with the simplistic nationalist position on Hindi and Urdu, say the national position on Hindi in India and the national position on Urdu in Pakistan. And, uh, and, and, and at a sim simplistic level, <coughs> there would be a tendency to say, trace Hindi down from Sanskrit and trace Urdu down from Persian. But Persian and Sanskrit are sister languages. They had already interpenetrated for centuries. So even, even that kind of tracing does not do justice to what really exists. On the other hand, English came to India much later in the 18th century. It, it related to languages in a different way. And that element has to be taken into account when we start looking at, at Indian novels in English. English should not be dismissed as a foreign language. English should also be treated as a language that requires certain strategies for it to be employed creatively. And that is essentially what one looks at in all these texts. We look at Atiyah Hussain's Phoenix Fled during the workshop. When I look at how certain discourses work in, in the story and how it again says certain things that are, I would say, particular to the sub subcontinental experience of the partition. But also, if you look at Anita Desai and other writers from the 1970s, 80s, who were sometimes, I don't know whether your generation re remembers that, uh, who were sometimes dismissed because they were mostly female writers, they were dismissed as writers of domestic fiction. Okay? That was a very insidious way of dismissing women writers, because after a generation of largely and ex excellent male writers, uh, Arkin Narayan, Raja Rao, and so on and so forth. You had a generation that was largely dominated by middle class women writing in English. I'm talking of Indian novels in English. And sometimes it was implied that these novelists dealt largely with domestic matters and so their canvas was limited. Now, if you really look at a novel like Fire on the Mountain, you realize that. That is a completely unjust reading of such novelists. Fire on the Mountain does seem to dis deal with a domestic canvas. There's Nanda Kaul living in a rich bungalow in a, in a hill station. And the very first scene has her looking out and seeing someone come up to the bungalow. And that scene is not immaterial because that is the trick that Anita, Rao, uh, Anita Desai uses in this novel all the time. Uh, what she does is she creates a house with certain windows. And she uses the windows to look at what exists outside. Okay. India enters the house through the windows. India is seen through the windows. It is an intellectually interesting gambit. What Anita Desai is doing is exactly what any good novelist does. No novelist really, no matter what he or she pretends to do, encompasses everything. Every good novel has a perspective. Every good novel takes a stand and looks from there. Some of them might take a number of different stands, but they're still not going to present you everything or try to present you everything because then they fail as novels they would not have a story, they would not have coherence, and they would not have the advantages of fiction. 
they would get reduced to what factors and of course if you're doing in fiction what factors then why write fiction you have to do something other than what factors by fact i mean say a sociological study or historical study and so on and so forth can i have the next slide okay now of course we have salman Rushdie. i'm sorry I, I i this is this is an old slide and I, I i so i just put it on and and i really wish that i had some other slides there because obviously you know what happened to Rushdie, something that many of us uh, feared would happen to him especially people like me i've had a mixed relationship to Rushdie. i've never met him he probably doesn't even know i exist so but uh, i've had a mixed relationship for a number of reasons. First of all, I'm a different kind of novelist. Magic realism, I look at with a degree of suspicion. For me, magic realism shares in tropes that are orientalist, a way of looking at non-Europe as a mixture of reality and fantasy. Uh, and, I, and for me, that is, that is a problematic position. But despite that, I've always accepted that within his own traditions of writing, Salman Rushdie is a brilliant writer. Uh, and, and, and the satanic verses in particular is an excellent multicultural British novel. The fact that it got embroiled in this Islamist controversy is a bit of a pity because what he's trying to do is something quite different. Of course, he gets embroiled in that and, 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 and then a whole set of reasons but of course, another reason why I have been perhaps uh, careful in my appraisal of Rushdie has to do with class. Now, I come from the middle classes. All of us probably do. I don't think there would be anyone here from a working class background in this virtual room. It's a very different kind of middle class. People from my kind of background do not write creatively and definitely do not write creatively in English. They are not sent to Eton or Oxford to study. They're not sent abroad to study at all, at least up to my generation. Now it seems to have become more common in professional middle class circles to send their children abroad too, but not when I was growing up. And the idea to be sent abroad to study creative writing, sheer sacrilege. I would never even think of asking my parents to put in money, if they had that kind of money, put in money into something like that. So from a certain class position, convent educated a small town, Indian. When I see India and when I see the world, I see things that are slightly different from what Salman Rushdie says, sees. And obviously, one has to stay true to one's own vision. And because of that, I have found certain elements in Salman Rushdie's writing more difficult to accept than perhaps I would have. Despite that, what he does is excellent within a certain tradition. And what he does in terms of language is perhaps best explicated by just looking at, 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 at this extract from the start of the Satanic Verses. To be born again, sang Jibril Farishta, tumbling from the heavens. First you have to die, hoji, hoji. To land on bosomy earth, first one needs to fly, tatta takathun. How to ever smile again if first you won't cry? How to win the darling's love, mister, without a sigh? Baba, if you want to get born again, and goes on like that. So as you can see, he's playing with uh what would now be called bollywood film lyrics uh and he's playing with uh, certain words that are incorporated into english whether that is for effect or for meaning is up to the critic to decide in the days when i was reading Salman rushdie critically i always felt that it was more for effect because and I, I once wrote an essay about about his use of dia lamp in uh, in the most last side where i pointed out that dia lamp essentially needs no translation it seems to be like the kind of word that we use in 
Indian English. But it isn't. Because mostly such composite words where we use one English word and one Hindi or Punjabi word do not repeat the same word. Because if we translated the lamp into English, it would be lamp lamp. If we translate it back, it back into Hindi or Urdu, it would be the idea. And in that sense, what it gives you is an effect. And I think that's what Salman Rushdie is trying to convey. He's trying to convey an effect. But whether it gives you an extra layer of meaning, that's a question that I think some Western critics are unable to answer. And unfortunately, some Indian critics do not engage in fruitfully because they end up dismissing that entire activity. Uh, and, 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 and my entire lecture is, 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 is meant to make you stand somewhere in between. Not easy dismissal, not easy acceptance. Now, if we move on further, the next slide, please. Uh, you obviously have lots of other Indian writers, and actually I'll stop with this slide because then I have a lot of other slides, but I think um, I've already exceeded my time, so I, I need to start wrapping up. Um, and, and obviously you can see that there are different ways in which Indian writers have been using English. Uh, from Raja Rao's uh, Sanskritized uh, um, reworking of English, syntactical Sanskritized reworking of English, to Salman Rushdie's uh, more colloquial uh, and, uh, uh, let's say, uh, gestural reworking of English, to in between, you also had people like Kushman Singh and others who would use certain words in the English discourse in different ways. All of them in different ways. What they have tried to do is address this problem, whether they were conscious of it or not, that English is, is spoken in a certain way by Indians in India. And it's not spoken in the same way between even two classes of Indians who might be speaking English. And it's not spoken at all by vast numbers of Indians who might use a word or two but do not speak English, more so outside the big cities. Now, that is what I think Indian English critics ought to be looking at. Instead of an easy dismissal on the one side, usually born from some kind of simplistic, nationalistic position, and an easy acceptance on the other side, usually influenced by highly globalized people who write for the New York Times and The Guardian, but have very little experience of India or Indian English in India. It is between these two positions that I think we need to situate ourselves if we are going to talk about Indian novels in English and not about something else, because there's a lot to be done in between these two positions, and not enough has been done as yet, in my opinion. Now, the other thing that I think we should keep in mind, and I'm going to really cut this short because I was going to talk a bit more about it, because this is one of my pet projects right now, is I think we also need to ask ourselves exactly what we mean by a novel. What is a novel? Or what we mean by literature? I think it's time to get back to these questions. There was a time when under lots of, uh, let's say, late 19th and, uh, and, and, and 20th century critics, you had a very simplistic definition of literature. And much of post-colonialism has been a pushback against it. Much of literary theory from the 1960s onward has been a pushback against it. This includes feminist theory too. And there were good reasons for it, because the literature as it was being defined was essentially a white man's literature. There was need to push back and talk of what else existed and what else can be done. Somewhere in the process of that pushback, we have stopped talking of literature. 
And what we usually do when we do literature is some kind of sociology, some kind of political science, some kind of any kind of stuff. These days, it, people seem to be doing literary Darwinism in my department, whatever that is. Uh, and uh, But literature surely that does something. What is it that literature does? Why don't we ask that question anymore? Why are we so afraid of asking that question? And I think what literature does at its simplest, and then of course you can unpeel this, this argument, is quite simple. And this is something that only literature does. Sociology cannot do it. History cannot do it. Psychology cannot do it. Religion tries to do it sometimes, but gets lost because of various reasons. What literature does is use language to talk about a world that cannot be limited to language, but that nevertheless affects language too. It is this process of talking about a world that cannot be reduced to language, but that again impacts on language, that literature does at its best. And this is why literature is important because it enables us to think about things that various disciplines do not allow us to think because the discipline by definition means disciplining language. Pinning it down with terms and concepts and so on and so forth. This is a necessary act. It's good they do it. The, the only way they can be disciplines is by doing it, but it does not exhaust reality out there. It still needs to be addressed, and literature is the one way we have been addressing it for ages. Which is why when you read, when you look at all these famous religious texts in any religious tradition, whether it's Islam or Hinduism or Christianity or Judaism, there's this insistence that their sacred texts are the best of literature. Along with that, there come the orthodox and increasingly fundamentalists who while insisting that this is the best of literature also tell you that this can be read only in these two and a half ways. Now that by definition takes away what is the strength of these religious texts because of course they are the best of literature too along with other kinds of literature. Of course. But they need to be read as literature as well. They cannot be disciplined in such a way that only one and a half particular meaning can be retained or extracted from them. Some ways what the religious do is similar to what happens in other disciplines. They discipline language. They pin it down with texts and so on and so forth. Actually, they discipline language across language. They even discipline rituals, the kind of clothes you wear, the kind of ways in which you can worship and so on and so forth. Because that is also a kind of structure from a structuralist position, that is also a language. Um, so, so I think these are the things we need to ask when we go back to Indian novels in English. What is it that this novel is doing that cannot be done in a history book or in a sociological book? or in a physics manual if you're writing science fiction. Uh, so that basically is what I had to say and I can see I've spoken for almost one hour. Uh, so I think I should stop now and let you come back to me with questions and remarks. Uh, there's just one thing I'll add, which is that I was unfortunately, or fortunately, keeping in mind that there's so much screaming and shouting and and uh, anger in the world. I was fortunately or unfortunately born with a hearing Im impairment. So I do have some trouble hearing. If you ask me a question and I come up with an answer that has nothing to do with your question, it's because I haven't heard you. In that case, repeat your question or better still type it in that box so I can read it. Okay? Go ahead. Thank you, Professor Kaya. Thank you for that. Uh, we'll tell our participants to type their to uh, type their questions in the chat box. As Thank in, you. they can tell me the question. I'll type it out here in the chat box.
uh, interesting remark. It's not a question, it's a remark. And it's true that there was a kind of development in Farsi from what I've been told by Farsi scholars. I don't have any Farsi. My father had a few sentences. My grandfather, I'm told, had could read Farsi. Uh, they were all doctors, but they still had it. <laughs> but in my case, despite being a literature language person, I don't have any Farsi. I don't even have much Urdu, actually. Basically, my languages are English, Hindi, with a background in Sanskrit, uh, and now, of course, the Scandinavian languages. Uh, so I'm, I'm told by scholars that there was a complementary Indianization of Farsi, definitely. Uh, and there was even a big debate about exactly how or, or what value uh, Farsi in Indian had. Uh, unfortunately, that's the debate that died out sometime in the mid 19th century and Farsi itself disappeared as a language. Um, uh, bear in mind that uh, I think it's uh, Harish Trivedi in one of his books he, where he, he talks about, uh, uh, with one of his essays, he talks about uh, Amitabh Bachchan or Harivansh Rai Bachchan because he's talking of Harivansh Rai Bachchan. Harivansh Rai Bachchan's translation of uh, a transcription of the Rubaiyat, which also inflicted his uh, or impacted his his great modernist poem Madhushala, uh, so and so I think that's a short extract from it, or unless it's from some other poem. Uh, so and uh, uh, so Harish Trivedi is talking about uh, how when Harivansh Rai Bachchan wanted to translate Rubaiyat. He also did a translation of Rubaiyat, uh, Omar Khayyam's Rubaiyat. Um, he could not go to the Farsi. He, he, he went to English translations and then he used them to work his way into a Hindi translation. But the family Mahabharat, the inherited family Mahabharat in his family was in Farsi. Uh, and, and in that sense, uh, Harish Trivedi points out that within a generation, that family had left, had, 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 had lost its far, Farsi inheritance. Uh, so that's what happened in the 19th century. I mean, I'm just commenting on what you said, definitely, but it's, 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 it's a good comment. <laughs> I'd seen a hand raise, oh, okay. <laughs> oh, definitely, definitely. I, I, I just, I just left out <laughs> uh, all about H Hatta for two reasons. Because, uh, I mean, all over the H Hatta is obviously, and Salman Rushdie is, I mean, he has, he has acknowledged that. I mean, you can see that all about H Hatta is 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 an extremely enabling text for Salman Rushdie. Uh, at the same time. All about Ash Hatter also uses a lot of colonial constructs, which are derived from certain ways in which Brit British speakers heard us speaking English. Uh, so, so I'm always very careful with all about Ash Hatter. It's an extremely enabling text, no doubt. But exactly where to quote from and how to quote it, it 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 requires more exegesis than Salman Rushdie's text too. But again, Salman Rushdie's text can also be faulted along those lines, okay? That's the problem with trying to make people speak a certain language which they don't, do not really speak. Because one of the problems that I've had with Salman Rushdie is that he makes Indians speak a certain kind of English, as if all of us speak all of us speak one kind of English, but we don't. We speak so many different kinds of Englishes, and then many of us do not speak English at all. Uh, so, yep. Uh, the, the other point, yeah, this, 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 is, this is the famous line, and I remember when I was a student and I read this line, I was really like up in arms. Uh, I felt personally insulted. I don't think any line has made me feel as insulted as this one. <laughs> so, and, and, and ever since my, my relationship to Macaulay has been extremely <laughs> one-sided. Uh, so, but, uh, but again, uh, what we have to keep in mind with Macaulay, there are two aspects. First of all, there was this debate between the Orientalists and the Anglicists. Okay? And Macaulay finally came down on the side of the Anglicists, and that's what he was. He was a modernist and an Anglicist, and so on and so forth. Um, now, when this came into being, there were Indians who were already writing in English. Derozio, for instance, 
was dead by then, I think, if I remember correctly. Uh, and uh, uh, so, so it's not as if uh, this enabled Indians to write English. Secondly, there was a strong demand among Indians, especially a group of progressive, Hindu progressives. There was more resistance among Muslims, but Hindu progressives in places like Calcutta to have education in English. What Macaulay was doing was again connecting to that kind of demand. He was using that demand that fitted into his own perception of what should be done in India. Bear in mind that this also happens with uh, something like uh, uh, much later uh, in, in 1855, 1856, when the Hindu Widow Remarriage Act is passed. Okay? Now, if you look at the Hindu Rema uh, Widow Remarriage Act, which is a major act, okay, it makes a huge difference. Okay? It, it shakes up many orthodox pillars. Okay? And it is passed because Dalhousie and co under pressure from a very small group of progressive Indians, but also pressure from Britain, want to enable Hindu widows to remarry. Now it is passed because Vidya Sagar is encouraged to come up with a petition. Now he gets about a bit under a thousand signatures for his petition. Vidya Sagar, of course, is the greatest scholar of Sanskrit and so on and so forth. But he gets less than a thousand signatures, which is still quite impressive. And the petition suggests a bill and it's passed on. Of course, the Orthodox group learns of it and they immediately within days come up with a counter petition that has more than 4,000 signatures, uh, led by some Raja in Calcutta. Now, Dalhousie and co. decide to implement with their Sagas petition, not the other petition, which actually has far more signatures and has been prepared in response, so it's been a quicker work. Okay. Now, that's the kind of complexity that I think we need to get back into. Uh, and, and something similar happens with, with Macaulay's uh, minute on India in education. What he's trying to do actually is talk of education along, he divides it, where you have classical education that continues to be imparted in Sanskrit and Persian. And then you have modern education, which he thinks should be imparted in English. Now, there are various reasons for that. Okay, Some of it is to reduce the influence of certain orthodox categories in Hindu and Muslim societies. Some of it is also in order to provide Indians with modern scientific education, which obviously is not available in Sanskrit or Persian, and is not available in the vernaculars yet, which do not have the same body of texts in the early 19th century. Okay. So again, what happens is very complex. And again, there are Indians pushing for this. The Indians pushing for education in English. Okay. Uh, and I, I, so I, I, I would say that uh, um, Macaulay is totally wrong about what he says about the native literatures of Indian and Arabia. Okay. So he's totally, he's completely wrong. He's completely wrong. He hasn't really read enough. Okay. And he's totally prejudiced, absolutely. Okay. But English in India is not just an effect of that minute. It's enabled by it, but I think it was already in, on the way. Some of the earliest colleges and schools teaching in English were not set up by administrators, but were set up by private organizations that consisted largely of Indians and so on and so forth. So in that sense, you, you, it's again a very complex story. That's what I'm trying to say, despite Macaulay being totally wrong about the literatures of India and Arabia. Thank you so much, Professor Kerr, for that 
detailed lecture and a detailed survey of the long history, not just of English fiction in India, but also the life of the language in India, the history of English in India. Thank you so much. We have we are sure that our participants have, will have many more questions lined up for you in the interactive session and the workshop that is coming up. Thank you so much, Professor Kerr. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. It's been a pleasure. Bye-bye. Yeah.